Hello, this is Jane Pilditch, Lead Patient Partner for the Inborn Heirs of Metabolism Stakeholder Network, and this is the second video in our training series. This video is about advocacy and partnering with professionals. In this video, we're going to talk about advocacy, what it means to be an advocate, the different levels of advocacy, what hat are you wearing, how will you represent others, and tips for effective advocacy. We'll also talk about partnering with professionals, what it means to be half empty, half full, perspective, values, communication styles, and the PCORI engagement principles. Our objectives for this video are that we gain a deeper understanding of what it means to be an advocate and who and what you're advocating for, discuss the barriers and benefits of partnering with professionals, and explore the PCORI engagement principles. I'm going to start this webinar out with a poem by Lauren Isley. It's called The Star Thrower. There was a man who was walking along a sandy beach where thousands of starfish had been washed upon the shore. He noticed a boy picking the starfish one by one and throwing them back into the ocean. The man observed the boy for a few minutes and then asked what he was doing. The boy replied that he was returning the starfish to the sea, otherwise they would die. The man asked how saving a few when so many were doomed would make any difference whatsoever. The boy picked up a starfish and threw it back into, into the sea and said, made a difference to that one. The man left the boy and went home, deep in thought of what the boy had said. He soon returned to the beach and spent the rest of the day helping the boy throw starfish into the sea. So. Many of you may have heard that poem before. Um, we use it in some of our trainings with um, parent leaders. And it really is about an advocate. The boy was an advocate. He wanted to make a difference, even if it was only for one starfish. Being an advocate is something that many of you are familiar with. Whether you realize, realize it or not, you're acting as an advocate just by joining this project. The dictionary just defines um, advocate a couple different ways. These are some definitions that I found. The first one is to speak or write in favor of, support or urge by argument, and recommend publicly. The other uh, definition that I found, and I, I have to admit I kind of like this one, is to plead in favor of. Um, I think I like the second one because I feel like when it comes to services and um, things from my son who has special health care needs, oftentimes I feel like I'm pleading. Um, but we're all advocates. That's why we are part of a stakeholder network. That's why we want to be engaged in this work. And um, so whether you realize it or not, um, that's what you're doing. There's different levels of advocacy. And um, these are taken from a, a, a chapter of a book called Ethics and Newborn Screening, Newborn Genetic Screening. Um, that you might be interested in if you're interested in issues of newborn screening. But this is by Janine um, DeMars Cody, and she um, identifies three levels of advocacy. And just before we start, I'd like to say that I recognize that many people that are involved in this project are very experienced advocates. Um, we have a lot of patient partners who have, you know, started programs in their state and, and started organizations and have worked to change laws and we recognize that and, and we're not trying to teach you about being an advocate. Um, rather, I think it's just, um, it's good to kind of review some things, maybe think about things in a way that you haven't before. I know that I've been advocating myself in one form or another for over 20 years, but I found that when I prepared this material, it was, it was really kind of a good lesson and a good refresher to think about the work that I do now and, and what that means in terms of advocacy. So the first level we call personal advocacy, and this is really just advocating for you or for your own child. It might mean you're trying to find the right doctor or the right school program for your child. The next level is group. And this might be if you joined an organization um, that helps other children with the same type of condition that your child has, like the National PKU Association, or a local you know, organization like the, we have the Capillary Down Syndrome Association here in Lansing, Michigan. Um, you're joining with like-minded people, but for the most part, many of the goals and the values that you share are the same. You're working towards the same purpose. 
The last level is public advocacy, and this is more global in nature and seeks to affect systems change. So this might be visiting your congressman or serving on a state newborn advisory committee or working at the national level. And this um, advocacy at this level is really for much larger groups of people. The difference in the levels of advocacy is not who is doing the advocacy or what kind of activities they're doing to advocate, but really it's the level at which the question is being addressed and the impact your efforts will have. The important point is that as one moves from personal advocacy to group advocacy, the circle of influence as well as the circle of responsibility enlarges. So the higher up this ladder you climb, the more complicated it gets. Not only do you have the potential to touch more people, but your actions will have greater impact. At the personal advocacy level, you really only have to consult with yourself or your immediate family, maybe a few trusted others. You can decide what doctor or school you want your child to go to, and it's not really going to impact a lot of other people or help or hurt them. Um, if you make a poor decision, it's really on you. At the group advocacy level, you have to be able to convince some other people of your agenda. You may not always agree on everything, um, and you try to come to consensus. You can't make a decision just based on what's right for your child. Um, the situations might be a little different. And at the public advocacy level, you might be expected to consult with an entire group of people or stakeholders. The decisions you're trying to influence have a very far-reaching impact. Think about state newborn screening advisory committees. Um, I sit on the one in Michigan, and we vote on new conditions that will be added to the newborn screening panel in Michigan. And, you know, what we vote for in those meetings affects every baby born in Michigan. So um, public advocacy has, um, like we said, a lot of potential for, for doing good or making change. But there's also a lot of, um, you know, far-reaching impact. And the decisions that you make um, affect a lot of people. The wider the sphere of influence you're trying to affect, the bigger the responsibility to include others who may not be like you or agree with your viewpoints. When you start advocating at the regional or national level, you may be representing other families who, who aren't like you or don't share your values or they don't agree with your viewpoints. Um, you probably don't even know who a lot of the people that you're representing are or what their viewpoints might be. So when you advocate for them and for those issues, it's important to think about what hat you're wearing or who, whose views you're representing. Um, being an effective advocate depends on having a clear understanding of what role you're playing. Advocating at the public level requires you to see the bigger picture and think in terms of not just what affects you or your family member, but how to change the landscape so that everyone benefits. And this might not always coincide with your personal agenda. What do you do if the people you represent don't necessarily agree with you? How will you represent them? How do you reconcile this with your own needs and your own values? And this is, this is something to think about when you get into these, these different roles that you have an opportunity for such impact. Um, there's two different ways of, of thinking about representation that I want to bring up um, without going into too much, too much detail. Um, there's what we call the delegate, and that's the person who really seeks out the opinions and positions of other people. Um, a lot of times, think about like a, an elected official. They go out into their district, they ask their constituents what they think, and they really try to um, support the needs and the opinions of those people. Um, the trustee is someone who relies on their own thinking and judgment. You know, if you were appointed to a committee, you you were appointed because of your expertise and and um, the input that you're able to give. And so you trust, you know, that that's the right thing to do when decisions come up. And neither way is really right or wrong, and they might change depending on the situation. But when you're in these roles, it's important to, to think about how you see yourself and the others that you may be representing. Another issue to think about is who's missing from our table? When we put together the IBEM CSN, we wanted to make sure we had a broadly represented group, um, people that lived in different parts of the country, people who were of different age groups, um, people who had different types of inborn errors of metabolism and were pursuing different treatments, some of the things that we were looking at. Um, 
but it's not always easy to do, um, particularly when you think of an inborn error of metabolism. They're so rare um, that, you know, on our Quest project, for example, I mean, we really try to recruit anyone we could find. Um, we just didn't have the luxury of having a lot of people out there to choose from. Um, and then you think about the people who are missing from the table for other reasons. Um, you know, individuals who are historically underrepresented in healthcare research, people with multiple conditions, low literacy, low um, socioeconomic status, poor healthcare access, people living in rural areas. Um, one of our clinicians we work with works with an Amish family, and they um, are not likely to be the ones who volunteer to um, come into the city and work on our work group or even to get on the computer and join by webinar. But how do we make sure that we're representing those people who have children with inborn errors of metabolism, um, considering their different values and their different preferences? Those people are are going to be affected by some of the work we do as well. And so, you know, how do we, how are we a good representative for everybody? So as we proceed with our work, we just want to make sure that we're conscious of those who are not at the table. Um, and also the people who are at the table who may have different opinions and experiences than us. Um, individuals who may have had a different journey than us um, and come to a different conclusion about the care that they want or what's important to them. Um, and this has come up in some of our different projects. We have stakeholders at the table who hold different viewpoints as far as inborn errors of metabolism with uncertain clinical consequences. And there's a really big disparity and differences in opinions on whether these conditions should be identified and treated. And so when we bring all these people together, it's important to realize um, that we may not all share the exact same opinions or want the same outcome. It's really a balancing act. There's no right or wrong way. Um, I think people have to figure out what they're comfortable with, um, how they proceed. Um, so in this webinar, when we do this live, we, we ask people to share some situations where they may have faced some of these issues, how, how they dealt with them, how they reconcile maybe their needs with the needs of others. And um, so I, I just encourage you to think about that as you go through this. It, past decisions that you've had to make, um, you know, other people that you've worked with trying to come to a common consensus or collaboration and um, some of the challenges maybe in reconciling everybody's differences. Some tips for effective advocacy. Um, I would say first and one of the most important is to really know your issue. Um, even though most of you are experts with regard to inborn errors of metabolism, designing a research proposal or being involved um, in research as an equal partner with the clinician is, is a whole other ballgame. So that's why we do some of these training and educational webinars. We um, not only want to um, reinforce the idea that you are an expert and you bring value to the table, but also um, there's going to be a lot of co-learning going on together. We want patient partners to feel comfortable as far as talking about issues for research and what we may or may want, may or may not want to pursue. And we want clinicians to be um, learning about what it's like to actually have a condition and what's important to our patient partners. So it's an, it's really important to um, kind of understand the basis um, of what you're advocating for. Learn the landscape. Um, we'll talk about what kind of research PCORI is looking for, um, what components that they require, and we'll talk about what's already been collected and what else we need to find out. Identify the players. It's important to know who you'll be working with and what some of the challenges they're facing are. So as we come together with um, our clinicians and our patient partners when they meet, um, the clinicians are a great source of resource, great source of information and resources for us as far as what's going on in the field already, um, what are treatment options that are out there, what research has been done, what questions remain. Um, the patient partners are wonderful with knowing what doctors out there are doing what, where they've um, met success, what organizations are out there supporting patients. So we really help each other figure out who the players are and what they're doing. But, um, you know, it, it can be complicated, but I think these are kind of a good basic um, things to know when you're trying to advocate is to, to learn the issue, learn the facts, 
learn the landscape kind of politically, what's going on, what's happened in the past, um, what the issues are, and then who are the players. Remembering your why, and we talked about that in the last webinar, why you're here, what's your purpose, your inner values, why do you get out of the bed in the morning. Knowing that and holding that close um, allows you to really um, deliver a, an impactful message when you advocate. Um, don't be afraid to share your story. Um, as I said before, the history of newborn screening programs is largely was largely built on parents and family members sharing the stories about their children and the conditions that they had and bringing it to the attention of lawmakers. And our stories are really powerful, and so don't be afraid to share yours. And we always tell uh, our stakeholders we don't want anyone to sh share anything they're not comfortable with. You know, we don't want to know all your family secrets, but... Um, the flip side of that is don't be afraid to share things um, because that's really what can help drive this forward. Um, the treasure chest is kind of a, um, symbolic of the, the, the expertise and the um, passion and what patients bring to the table. Um, so again, recognizing the value, why you're here, why you're important to the project, and ask questions. Um, I know that it's... Um, challenging sometimes it's intimidating to sit with a group of researchers or doctors or um, public health specialists when that's not your background it doesn't um, we're, nobody's expecting patient partners to be experts but but ask questions so that you have a greater understanding of it um, there's a lot of acronyms and and things that they say when I've sat in meetings with our clinicians and and they they welcome questions they really they want you to be an equal partner and to understand so I would encourage everybody to to remember that in this work um, personal and group advocacy are certainly much easier to do when you can just make a decision for yourself or with a smaller group of people who are like-minded and want the same things um, and they're no less important than public advocacy but if we work together as public advocacy, we have potential for change on a much bigger level, and we have potential to affect larger groups of people. Um, and so that's why I, I think I like this quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think the broader perspective of including patient partners in research not only helps us to go further, but it will help our efforts and our results to be more sustainable, sustainable sustainable and more meaningful. And so this is a good segue into our next topic, which is partnering with professionals. Um, the IBEM CSN is made of geneticists, dietitians, public health professionals, researchers. This may be the first time some of our stakeholders have worked with individuals from these fields. And, it, and like I said before, it can be intimidating. And you might feel like, what could I possibly have to contribute to this? How could I possibly have anything important to say? So this is an exercise we do um, when we do these webinars live, and I've done it um, in groups of people meeting in person. And again, I, I like this one. I would encourage you to take a few minutes to think about it on your own. Um, it's a good exercise to do with groups that you work with. Um, we, we go around the room and we give each person a couple, two minutes or less, real quick, to pick a couple of these questions and answer them. Um, and it's called the gift interview. What are three qualities that make you a great family member and friend? What two to three skills make you an effective advocate? <clears throat> and what two to three talents and hobbies do you love so much you could get lost in them for hours? And in, in addition to getting to know each other a little bit better and learning about each other, um, it's really this exercise is designed to show that we all have gifts or strengths. We all have things that we're good at. Um, so each member of the stakeholder network, patient partners and clinicians, public health, everybody brings gifts and strengths to the team. We all have strengths and weaknesses. In fact, you could say we're half full and half empty, meaning um, there's some things I'm really good at and I like to do. Um, I enjoy public speaking. I enjoy researching. I enjoy writing. Other things, not so much. I'm not so much into the data and the statistics and all that kind of thing. Um, but we have other people who are, um, you know, Matt, our senior research scientist, that's, that's what he likes to do. Um, so we make a good team. And um, when working with others, the idea really is to tap into each of our strengths, because by working together, we can be really powerful. 
um, with regard to the IBEM CSN, the clinicians have technical expertise, medical knowledge. They're familiar with the data that's already out there in our database and, and what the, the knowledge in, with regard to inborn errors of metabolism is. But they don't know what it's like to live with the condition or care for someone with the condition day to day. And they don't know what's important to individuals with the condition regarding treatment options and outcomes. And the patient partners have that knowledge. But as patient partners, we might not know what's possible or what options are out there. So together we can approach our work in a way that ensures more meaningful results for everyone. This is another activity we do when we bring our professionals and our um, patient partners together. Um, just take a minute to look at the slide and, and see what you see. Some people look at the white and they see a vase. Other people immediately notice the outside um, black borders um, that looks like two faces looking at each other. And here's another one. I see a man who I think looks like William Shakespeare with the two eyes, um, he's got two eyes there, the nose and the mouth. Other people see a woman walking down a street and some buildings in the background. This one usually throws people for a loop. I see a frog. If you turn your head sideways and look at it, you can see a horse. It's the eyes, the nose, ears, and the mane. Sometimes once you know the other image is there, then you can see it. Other times you still can't see it. And that's because we all have different perspectives or ways of looking at things. We all approach problems from a different perspective. The perspectives and the gifts that patients and family members bring to the IBEM CSN is going to be very different than those of the clinicians. Like the pictures, it doesn't mean one version is right and one is wrong. It's just that we all have a different way of looking at things. I remember when one of the doctors said to me when my son was little and very ill that he was interesting. And let me tell you that no mother wants to hear that her baby is interesting. <clears throat> and at one point, we had to go up to the top floor of the children's hospital, <coughs> excuse me, where a photographer took pictures of him for a medical journal because they had never seen anybody like him, and they wanted to, to try and figure out what was going on and certainly to help us. But it was absolutely devastating for me um, to think that they looked at him as some unique, you know, scientific abnormality and you know he this is my baby um, and so patients and practitioners have a different way of looking at things it's not to say that doctors don't care because they do they care greatly or they wouldn't be doing what they want to do but it is different when it's your family member um, and so we bring different sides of this to to the table when we work with our clinicians um, patients and practitioners sometimes have very different values as well. Um, I think I said before in um, the webinar that the doctors would tell me to do X, Y, and Z when we were home. Um, well, if I did X, Y, and Z every single day, I would never have time to just be a mom. And a lot of the expectations of the doctors and the therapists, you know, PT and OT and speech and developmental and then the GI and the feeding specialist and um, they were conflicting and overwhelming. So I, I, I valued my mom time sometimes. Sometimes we just had to say, you know what, we're not doing PT right now. We're just going to snuggle on the couch or something. Um, so sometimes our values can be very different. And the values of different specialties can be conflicting. You know, we had conflicts between GI and the feeding specialist. Um, and our values can change. Getting a diagnosis when Michael was young was extremely important to me. Um, as he's older now, we've, we've still continued to seek it out, but having a name isn't as important to us. Um, we've just, we've kind of, you know, this is our life and this is who he is and um, a name's not gonna change anything. So, but different people have different, different ideas about that and that's okay. Uh, the point is that researchers often look at um, a patient with a condition is a problem that has to be solved, and patients and family members see things differently. Um, researchers don't always agree with each other, and neither do families, um, and that's okay. It's just important to realize that we all um, have different values as, as we do this work. We also have different communication styles. Um, 
and I'm sure you've probably seen some of these different um, categories in, in different, you can take like different surveys of what personality or communication style are you. Some people are outgoing, some introverted, some people are detail oriented, some people see more the big picture. We have people who are more people oriented versus those who are more task oriented. Think of a social worker or an accountant. You know, they, they have very different things they like to do. Um, you can also categorize people as a thinker or a doer. Um, feelings versus facts, leader versus follower. And not one of them is right or wrong. You need people from all of these groups in to on a team to be successful. You know, we couldn't have everyone be task oriented and no one concerned about the people in the group. Um, so again, it's just differences um, and taking everybody's strengths as a whole makes the team stronger. This is just another slide about the acronyms and, and jargon again when, when working with professionals. That can be a challenge. Um, I went to the ACMG conference, that, which I used an acronym there. It's the American College of Medical Genetics, and I went as a patient advocate one year. And I could not understand every third word they said in the presentations because it was very detailed genetic information. And I had to ask a lot of questions. Um, and so that can be a barrier with doctors. Oftentimes I found we had doctors who spoke kind of over our heads and we had doctors who spoke down to us. So um, there's a fine line. Um, and this is likely to come up when working with a team of clinicians, but it's important to, to ask questions and so you feel like you, you can participate in the conversation. And like I said, the, the clinicians on our project are very welcoming of that, and so we encourage you to do that. We um, have discussed differences in perspective, value, and communication styles. Um, what are some other barriers? And, and when we do this as a group, we ask people to brainstorm and come up with different ideas that, that they've been they've experienced. Some of the, the more common answers that we hear are that patients don't trust practitioners. They've had a bad experience with a doctor. They don't really believe what they, what they say. Patients are afraid to ask questions if they don't understand anything. They don't want to look stupid or they, they, they are kind of overwhelmed when they're in the appointment and then they leave and they had all these questions and they didn't feel comfortable asking them and they just, they don't get answers. Um, Patients think practitioners can't possibly understand what they're going through or that they don't care. And I know that I often felt that way. You know, you just, you don't know what it's like when I go home and live with this day to day. Practitioners don't think patients have anything to contribute or they can't understand the issues. They feel like maybe they're the expert and they have the medical knowledge and um, they're there to tell you what you need to do. Um, practitioners don't think patients are able to see the big picture beyond their own individual case. Um, you know, they working in a group project like this, you have to be able to look at issues that impact more than, you know, your, yourself. It's the, it's the um, public advocacy. And sometimes practitioners think, oh, they, they're just doing this for their own kid and they can't see that. Um, and there are other barriers out there, certainly, but these are some of the ones that we um, talk about and... Um, you know, take a couple minutes to think about some of the things that you've run into. So working together, we, we acknowledge that these barriers are out there. Um, we want to overcome them and build bridges inse instead of walls. And I think probably the most um, effective way that, that we can do that is really be more, just being more aware of our attitudes and our actions. Um, recognize that you may have some anger towards doctors um, and you know it, it might be there and that's okay but become aware of it you know know that that kind of colors your your perception of things um, our goal really with our IBEM CSN is to level the playing field have an environment where there's trust mutual respect and where patients are recognized as equal partners um, that's why we spend some time on these webinars, and the clinicians have a webinar that they do on working with patient partners, and we discuss many of the same things, but from the other point of view. Um, we want to be able to work together and, and break down these barriers. Um, so we would encourage everyone to assume good intentions, assume that everyone at the table here really has a good intention of working with each other and values each other's input. Um, be willing to share your expertise honest communication, and be the partner that you'd like someone else to be with you. I'm going to touch upon briefly the PCORI engagement principles. Um, and these are principles that the organization puts out there and requires of all of its research proposals. If you want to get funded by PCORI, you have to show that you are really engaging um, 
patients and its meaningful engagement, and they look for these components. Co-learning, reciprocal relationships, partnerships, transparency, honesty, and trust. So co-learning is really, um, we're not trying to make you into a researcher by um, working with patient partners. You don't have to understand, um, you know, all of the medical background and issues and how to set up an experiment and that type of thing. We just are trying to have people learn enough about the research process that they can be a part of it. And the practitioners are learning um, more about patient-centeredness, what it's like to live with a disease. So we're learning together. Um, we're learning each other's stories so that we can be um, better partners. Reciprocal relationships and trust. Um, we talk about trust a little more in one of our other webinars when we talk about conflict, but we do a lot of icebreaker activities when people come together. Um, people, you know, usually roll their eyes and don't want to do them, but we do them so people get to know each other, um, get to see what each other's um, about, and that, that builds trust. It creates bonds. Um, our annual meetings, we have networking time, we have social times, and that also helps to build trust. Um, Relationships that are reciprocal are ones that value the perspectives, values, communication styles each individual brings to the relationship. And it's important to realize that our differences can complement each other and ultimately they'll strengthen their outcomes. Transparency and honesty are two other PCORI engagement principles and these really imply open communication and providing a safe place where people feel they can say what they want and not be afraid to ask questions. Um, and this is, again, we had this, I've shared this example before, I think. Um, we had this in our Quest project. We had an obvious difference in opinion between a clinician and a patient partner on the significance of an inborn error of metabolism and whether or not it required treatment. And they were really able to ask each other questions and talk about it and share their experiences. Um, you know, that they had an open dialogue about it, and that was really because they um, were allowing for transparency and honesty and trust, and it allowed for a good conversation. So that's something we're really trying to, um, to build into our partnership and our group. You can do what I cannot do. I can do what you cannot do. Together we do great things. That's just a quote that I, I really like, and I feel like it, it fits well with this section. Um, the key to working effective, together effectively as a group is to tap into each of our strengths, acknowledge our different perspectives, recognize our values might not be the same, and appreciate the variety of personalities and communication styles that we bring. So when we think back to that half empty, half full, um, by having everybody at the table, um, we all bring our half empty and our half full, but when we put it together, we get a full glass. Uh, the, I'd like to just share the resources that we talked about in this webinar, the Star Thrower poem, and also PCORI engagement resources. If you go to that web page, there's a lot of different sections. Um, and I would encourage you to look at those. It contains information about the principles, about an engagement rubric that PCORI uses, and just some other um, handouts some, that you can print off that they have that are really helpful. As always, feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the project or this webinar. Um, a, much of this information was built um, from a leadership training that MPHI has, and I would also be happy to share any information about that with you. Thank you for joining today.